Today, we're looking at the smallest multi-system emulator that I've ever gotten to play with, the MiU Mini V2. The console came shipped in this slightly hardened carrying case with the MiU Mini logo on it, which I believe is new to the V2. Unzipping around the outer edge reveals that this case has more than enough room for the console itself, as well as a short USB-C charging cable, a microSD card, and a USB microSD card reader, because for most people, you're going to want to customize the game library as soon as you get the device. You also have to check out this cute little plastic bag that the device comes wrapped in. It's got the same block art version of the Miu from the carrying case, and it's details like this that make it stand out above other handhelds, making it feel more like a retail device. The Mini definitely lives up to its name. It's adorably small. Like, almost unbelievably small for all it's able to do. And while its design aesthetic is clearly based on the original Game Boy, it's only a fraction of the size. It also packs in a fairly impressive amount of controls. A regular D-pad, plus four action buttons, as well as select, start, and menu buttons adorn the front. The only thing it's missing is some sort of analog stick. And around the back, we have four shoulder buttons. The screen on the Mini is a 2.8 inch IPS display that runs at a native resolution of 640x480, which is going to end up being plenty for all the systems that the Mini supports. Otherwise, the bottom of the unit has a standard headphone jack, a microSD slot for the included card, and a USB-C charging cable. On the left hand side of the unit we find a volume dial, and there's also a power button with status lights on the top. I ordered mine in grey, which ended up being quite a bit darker than the shell of the original Game Boy, but it's also available in a few colours, so you can pick what you like. Internally, the Mini is powered by an ARM Cortex A7 processor, which is a dual-core processor running at 1.2GHz. It's paired with 128MB of RAM, and it can use microSD cards up to 128GB for storage. Well, now that we've given the Mini V2 a good looking over, it's time to talk about the gaming experience. A device like this is only as good as its controls, and there's both good and bad here. The good is, the buttons feel great to press, requiring just the right amount of force to trigger. They're not spongy, they're not too hard, they feel just right. The bad is, this device is still small, and as a result, it ends up being a bit cramped for long gaming sessions. The buttons on the back of the unit, while feeling just as nice to press, end up being even more cramped. They're not unusable by any measure, and I can't really think of a better positioning for them, but it's something to be aware of. The display on the other hand, I only have positive things to say about. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's sharp, the colors are vibrant, and really it's a great experience. The out-of-the-box user experience is okay. The interface is usable, but it's definitely not my favorite. I decided to review this unit as it came, but a quick Google search tells me that there's already plenty of custom images that will no doubt improve that experience even further. When it comes to battery life, there's a claimed 5-6 to six hours, and that story checks out. Gameplay ran in that range, and when I left it on the demo screen of Tekken 3 for the PlayStation 1, the battery lasted just shy of 7 hours. Pretty remarkable for a device this small. The Mini comes with support for the NES, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, PlayStation, Master System, The Wonderswan Color, TurboGrafx-16, Neo Geo Portable, the Atari 2600, the Atari 7800, as well as a few arcade systems. It also includes the FF Play application that allows you to watch movies on the Mini if that's your thing. Now, I did run through all of the systems, and while we could go through the list exhaustively, I thought it'd be better to just give the highs and lows. The high point definitely goes to its ability to play PlayStation games. While the games included on the card were not in English, I did manage to get through them, and they all seemed to play at or near full speed, with only occasional audio breakage. So, with the highest claim system on it running well, you'd expect all the other systems to follow suit, right? Well, that's mostly true. Systems like the Atari, NES, SNES, and the original Game Boy work as you would expect. Plenty of power here to deliver really decent emulation. One surprise was an issue with the Sega Genesis emulator. While the games do appear to be running at full speed, audio is noticeably desynced and delayed, in a magnitude of like a quarter to a half a second and sometimes longer. You can see it pretty clearly in this clip from Sonic the Hedgehog. That jump audio effect should happen as you press the button, but it doesn't trigger until the top of the arc of the jump instead. 
And that delay was present in all Genesis games that I tried, but Sonic makes it just a bit more obvious. I also noticed that the audio in the Game Boy Advance emulator seemed delayed as well, but not nearly as much. Other than that, it delivers on all its promises. It's a solid little handheld that does everything it can to max out its minuscule footprint. And while it does have those minor audio issues, it's more than likely something that's already been ironed out with newer firmware. I'll be testing different firmwares on this in the future, so make sure you subscribe for that. Other than that, this thing is great. True portable gaming that fits into your pocket, and it's definitely one of my favorite little emulators. Hey, thanks for sticking around till the end. I hope this review helped you. If it did, toss me a thumbs up. If there's other stuff you think I should test on this, or if you've had a better experience or a different experience than me, let me know in the comments below. That's it for this one, but until next time, stay creative.